Welcome to Spotlight. Uh, we have here with us uh, Dr. Uh, Shaheen Alani. He's a urologist at the Henry Ford Health System. Welcome to MEA. Thank you so much. How are you today? Good, good. Pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, when uh, the doctor says cancer, it's a situation when people fear. Yes. Tell yes. us about this. So. The definition of cancer is that if you have a normal cell and that normal cell is being exposed to the environment, to harmful environmental agents, mm -hmm. this cell loses the control, the normal control on the process of division and this cell starts to divide uncontrollably. And then you end up with what's called a mass. So instead of the normal structure of that organ, you have this cell that's dividing uncontrollably, you develop a mass that's present within that organ and that mass would basically cause pain and then disrupts the function of that organ. In addition to that, what happens is that when this process of de-differentiation, we call it de-differentiation, when that normal cell is, becomes very abnormal, it loses attachment to the surrounding cells. Mm -hmm. So that allows that abnormal cell to basically travel in the blood, get to other parts in the body, and that's what we call metastasis. So that's when the cell implants itself. So for example, if you have bladder cancer, if the cell, leaves, if the cell of bladder cancer leaves the bladder, goes into the blood, it can implant itself, for example, in the lungs or in the bone or in the brain and then starts divide the, dividing there as well and that's when the patient develops for example a mass or a brain mm -hmm. tumor mm -hmm. or he develops a mass in his lungs or he develops mass in his bone and because this is an abnormal structure growing within that environment the patient starts developing complaints whether it's bone pain mm -hmm. when that mass is in the bone cough when that mass in his lungs or he develops seizures if that mass is in the brain and it's, it's a very very difficult diagnosis the problem with, with cancer is that Unlike, for example, infections. For infections, we have antibiotics. We have drugs that we can use to cure um, infections. Mm -hmm. Within cancer, if the patient presents with a, what we call a high-risk disease, this is the type of the disease that could spread very early. If we did not diagnose this disease early and the disease actually spreads, goes to other organs, usually we don't have cure for it. How come some patients, uh, they wouldn't find out about uh, their cancer till their stage three or four? Yes. How is that? So it, it depends, on, it depends on, on the organ. Some organs, what happens is that the patient actually noticed something mm -hmm. ahead of time. Like, he, for example, for when I, that, if I go back to that example of bladder cancer, mm -hmm. most of my patients, they've seen blood in the urine a year and a half or two years before that, but they just did not go and seek medical attention. They did not talk to their primary care provider. They did not ask a urologist. And the, at the, the only point in time they would go to see a urologist is when they're having a lot of pain, and that's when the disease is So is it fast. negligence? Uh... Some of it, is, some, of it, some of it is definitely negligence. There are some other, some other organs, like for example with pancreatic cancer. The problem with pancreatic cancer is that there is so much space around the pancreas mm -hmm. for that mass to develop and to get to like stage three or stage four before the patient would feel it. So that's a different situation. Okay. But many, many of the cancers, especially the genitourinary malignancies, the patient would feel something, but he's going to neglect going to talk to his primary so care provider. So it has provider. to be something abnormal. It has to be very abnormal for them to actually go talk to the primary care provider. Okay, uh, go yeah. Ahead. Specifically, we're going to talk today about the bladder uh, cancer. Yes. So, what are the causes of uh, uh, bladder, cancer? bladder cancer? The main cause, the main risk factor for bladder cancer is smoking. What happens with smoking is that basically the smoke that comes out of the cigarette, this is a very, very complex chemical structure and has a lot of these agents that actually change the DNA inside the cells and that's mm -hmm. what starts the process of what we call carcinogenesis that's when the cancer starts developing so when the when the when the person is smoking he's exposing to the body to the chemical structure of the smoke and that changes the cell cells causing cancer if you have somebody who's who's a smoker his chances of developing bladder cancer are 400 percent higher than somebody who doesn't smoke but it is the main and only cause of bladder so it's cancer. the main cause of bladder cancer. There are other causes of bladder cancer, but they are nowhere as prevalent as smoking because this is a very common habit, especially in the Middle Eastern culture. So any kind of smoking, uh, cigarettes, hookah, uh, uh, any of that? 100%. There is no harmful, there is no harmless smoking. Any type of smoking is has been related to the, the development of malignancies and has been related to the development mm -hmm. of bladder cancer. 
other risk factors for bladder cancer are other chemical exposures. Like if you, we have those patients who come in, they've worked their entire life in a chemical mm -hmm. factory and they've been exposed to these chemicals that change the structure of their body. Mm -hmm. They could also develop bladder cancer. And then the only other group that could develop bladder cancer are those patients who have long-term irritation of the bladder. We have patients who basically can't pee. Okay. And what happens is that we put a catheter in and they have to be managed with a catheter for a long period of time. If they are, if they are not supervised and if they are not watched very closely, mm -hmm. the irritation to the bladder that happens from the catheter itself could cause bladder cancer. Okay, okay. If we want to talk about uh, treatments, uh, if uh, a patient has a bladder uh, cancer and does a patient need to have the bladder removed? Taken out. So th the, way, the way we look at bladder cancer is that we divide bladder cancer into what's called low grade and high grade. And there is another um, categorization, it's called invasive and non-invasive. Okay? Mm -hmm. The reason that we divide bladder cancer into low grade and high grade is that low grade disease means that this disease has low potential to spread outside the bladder. The high grade disease, the cells are so abnormal that they lose the attachment to the surrounding cells and therefore, the chances of this disease to spread outside the bladder and go somewhere else inside the body is very, very high. So that's the first distinction within bladder cancer. Yes. This is what, and this is something that the patient also needs to know, whether his disease is a high-grade disease or a low-grade disease. So you will find out right away if this is the case? So what happens usually is that this patient comes into clinic after complaining of blood in the urine. That's the most common mm -hmm. presentation in bladder cancer. We would do investigation, we do a workup for what we call, so that presentation, blood in the urine, is called hematuria. That's the medical term for it. And the investigation includes two types of studies. The first one is imaging. Mm -hmm. So we do an x-ray that looks at their kidneys, that looks at the tubes between the kidney and the bladder, and then also looks at the bladder, because mm -hmm. these are the common sources for blood in the urine. Yes. That's one type of investigation or workup. The other type of investigation is actually putting a scope and this is something we do in clinic under local anesthetic. We put a scope that looks inside the bladder to see. It's like a major uh, procedure? Mm -hmm. uh, Not uh. at all. It takes anywhere between three and five minutes. Usually patients are comfortable when we do this procedure. It's even less invasive than, for example, doing a colonoscopy. Because the urethra, which is the urine passage, is very short. Mm -hmm. And we use this special numbing gel that basically numbs the urethra from the inside. And what happened next? So once we make a diagnosis, once we see, for example, a mass inside the bladder and we think that this mass, it could be cancerous. It could be, you said. Could be, because we cannot make any diagnoses until we get a tissue sample. So oh. just by looking at it, we can suggest, we can say, look, this could be bladder cancer. But just by looking at it, we cannot treat. So we you have to do a further testing in order to find out. Exactly. Okay. And that further testing is basically, if we can do it in clinic, if the tumor is small, we can take biopsies from that tumor in clinic and then we cauterize the base of the area where we took the biopsy so that there is no bleeding. Yeah. If the tumor is bigger, then we'll have to go to the OR. We use bigger scopes because we can't use those bigger scopes in clinic because the patient is not going mm -hmm. to tolerate them. And then we basically remove, or we call it resection. We resect that tumor, we send it to the pathologist, and that pathologist is going to tell us, look, this is high grade or low grade bladder cancer. And he's going to say, look, this is either invasive or non-invasive bladder cancer, and that determines what we do for the next step. And how quick is that for the patient? Because, you know, patients wait, and they're worried, and they want to know what's going on fast. How fast is that? Does that happen? Usually, most people who deal with cancer, urologic oncologists, for example, in Henry Ford, we try to get the patient as soon as possible to the OR to do that mm -hmm. because we need to get that diagnosis because once we make the diagnosis mm -hmm. and we know what the grade and what the stage of the disease, we can determine how soon or how quick do we need to move to the next step of, of treatment, okay? Okay. So usually I try to get those patients in within, a while, within about a week. So we prepare them as quick as possible because remember, most patients, so most people, they don't develop cancer and they, until they are older. Median age for Especially bladder Especially you mean bladder uh, exactly. cancer, okay. 100%. So the median age for bladder cancer, most patients who develop bladder cancer are 70 years of age. 70? 70. Okay. So we have to make sure that before we put this patient under anesthesia, we have to make sure that his primary care provider made sure that his heart is going to tolerate general anesthesia, that his lungs are going to tolerate general anesthesia. And that's what takes us a few days, that preparation process. So it's a harder process for, for an, an, an older people. Well, that, that's the issue with bladder cancer is that when we come to talk about treatment, the fact that bladder cancer patients are older makes it harder for them to tolerate whatever therapy we do to treat bladder yeah, cancer. Yeah, but if you remove their bladder, can they handle at this age 
to live without a bladder? Without a bladder cancer. How would you do that? How would you do that? So let me just take you one step back. Yes, sure. And I wanted to say that if the patient has a low-grade disease or even if he has a high-grade disease and the disease is not invasive, it's just a superficial disease, the disease that does, does not go deeper into the wall of the bladder, we do not, there is no need to take the bladder out mm -hmm. because the treatment would be then removing the tumor with a scope and then we have special medications that we can put inside the bladder to prevent this disease from coming back. But do you guarantee, do you guarantee it not coming back? So, depending, <laughs> we have criteria for, we can predict what is the risk of this disease coming back. Mm. We have what's called the low and intermediate. There are, there are other subdivisions within this superficial disease, but we can tell the patient, look, there is, this is the chance that if we treated you with resecting the tumor, and giving you the intravesical, we call it intravesical because we put it inside the bladder. These are the chances that you are not going to develop recurrence after treatment, okay? Mm -hmm. So the group that has the, where we remove the bladder, that's only within the group that has a high risk disease that's going deeper into the wall of the bladder. And we cannot treat them with just the endoscopic resection because the endoscopic resection is not gonna be able to remove that entire tumor. Because mm -hmm. when the disease is invasive, this means that the tumor is actually invading within the wall of the bladder. So that group is the group that we take the bladder out in mm -hmm. the high-grade invasive disease, and that's a procedure called cystectomy. Mm -hmm. And if you look at all the procedures that we do within urology, this is the most major procedure and the one that has the highest rate of complications. And side effects. And side effects. Part of it because we are not only taking the bladder out. If it's a male, we are taking the bladder out. We are taking the prostate out. We're taking it has to be... Uh, all in bulk. Everything. Everything and the lymph nodes out. The reason behind it is that the prostate and the lymph nodes are other locations where that disease, since the disease started invading into the wall of the bladder. Might spread. Might go to, yes, might So spread. you have to take everything out. Everything comes out. And if it's a female, then we are taking the bladder out, we're taking the uterus out, the fallopian tubes, the ovaries, and the lymph nodes. So basically everything inside the pelvis is coming out So when you we treat make it. sure that everything is out. Everything is out. Okay. Because the, our chances at curing high-risk invasive bladder cancer is when the disease is still localized. You do not want to leave residual disease because if, I, if we, for example, leave a residual disease, if we leave residual cancer inside the pelvis and that disease spreads, then there is no cure for it. Our oh, risk, that's it. That's it. There is chemotherapy. So it's only one time. Uh, like you go in, take everything out. Yes. Okay. Because what happens is that if the disease is metastatic, there is chemotherapy that we can use, but that chemotherapy does not cure that disease. What happened with the chemotherapy is that you extend the survival for a few months. So you're talking only for bladder uh, cancer or for any other? So in general. In general. In okay. general, most of, can most of the cancers, when the disease is localized, that's the best chance at curing that cancer. Okay. When the disease spreads, that's where we don't have a very good therapy to control it. So. Like, for example, if we're talking about whether it's prostate cancer or kidney cancer or bladder cancer, testicular cancer, penile cancer, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. these are the cancers that we treated with in urology. For all of these diseases, if the disease is localized and we treat it, then we can cure it. Once the disease spreads, we don't have cure for any metastatic cancer, any bladder cancer that spreads. Nothing. There is no cure for those, no. Okay. What about, like, a follow-up after you take everything out? Uh... So what happens is that when we take everything out, Remember, the kidneys have to drain, send the urine to some place, okay? Yes, yes. And, and the way we do it is that that's when some people, when, the, when you talk them, to them about treating bladder cancer and they go online, they see patients with a bag on the outside. Yes, uh, tell us about the, the bag. <laughs> yeah. So what happens with the bag is that we have to, we have to collect the urine that the kidneys are In that bag? In that bag. Okay. So to get the urine from the kidneys to the bag, we connect both tubes, the ureters that come down from the kidney to a piece of bowel. So we actually separate a small piece of bowel, connect mm -hmm. both kidneys to that piece of bowel, and then that other end of the piece of bowel is op opens to the skin. So how big is the bag? So that bag is, well, I would say is about a pint or just slightly above a pint. In the body, pint. how would the body react to the bag? So that bag is on the outside and it's actually sticking to... Oh, it is to on the outside. It's okay. on the outside. Okay. So that's, that's one way of doing it. So if we have somebody who's elderly, very unhealthy, cannot handle a prolonged procedure, and who cannot basically take care of himself that well, then the option is the bag. But the other option is that if we have a motivated relatively healthy patient who has bladder cancer, then we can, instead of having a bag on the outside, we can take a bigger piece of bowel, mm -hmm. and we basically suture that bigger piece of bowel into a, like a bag on the inside. Yeah. Okay, because, and that bigger piece of bowel that is being sutured into this bowl, 
is going to substitute for their bladder, and that's what's called the neobladder. So instead of the patient living with a bag on the outside that's sticking to the skin with an adhesive and it's difficult to take care of, everything would be on the inside. And usually if the patient takes care of that neobladder, he would be able to live, to have a lifestyle that's approximately similar like to the normal, lifestyle. Uh, okay, is there a, like a, it, so it's a preference for the bag if it's the inside or the outside, or if he's a, the patient is a good candidate to do that? It's more of a good candidate to do that. Because okay. most patients, when you give them the option of having a plastic bag on the outside and living with that. No one would like that. No uh, one would like that. Yes. But we have criteria for patients who can have a neobladder because we want to make sure that if we are doing a major sp surgery, mm -hmm. To construct the neobladder is, would take twice the time to just connect that piece of ball to the skin. We want to make sure that after the surgery, this patient is capable of taking care of the neobladder so that he does not develop any significant or major complications. Okay. So it's more of the patient being a candidate for neobladder than actually a personal choice. Any other thing about uh, the bladder cancer that we should, that the audience uh, should, should know, know about. about, yes? So I would say probably in the past, 20 to 30 years, there, has no been, there hasn't been any major development in bladder cancer. But now there is a new class of agents. They are called anti-PD-1. P as in pool, and okay. D as in dog, anti-PD-1 yeah. agents. And those anti-PD-1 agents are even now replacing chemotherapy because they are showing better activity in treating bladder cancer than chemotherapy. And the trials that started to use anti-PD-1s in bladder cancer, they started with the metastatic disease, mm -hmm. but they are now moving into that space where we are trying to prevent recurrence of the disease. So patients, so we have a, we're gonna open a trial at Henry Ford where if you had a cystectomy done and we think your dis disease is a high risk disease and has a high chance of coming back after the cystectomy, after taking the bladder um, out has mm -hmm. been done, then you would go on those agents to try to prevent this disease from coming back. So you're saying no need for chemotherapy or it's a replacement for uh, uh, chemotherapy? So the, ho the hope is that they are going to replace chemotherapy and there are that's trials. That's a very good hope. It's, a, it's, it's a, amazing, actually. Fantastic. And the good thing about these agents is one, that their profile of side effects is much better than the profile of side especially effects. Especially the hair loss and the pain. Exactly. Yeah. Patients, they don't develop the hair loss. Nothing. Nothing. They, nothing happens as okay. far as the hair goes. They are not going to develop any of the nausea and vomiting that patients get when they get the chemotherapy. Even, so one of the major issues with the chemotherapy is that when you give the chemotherapy to the patient, their white blood cell count would go down, their red blood cell count would go down, and they would okay. need blood transfusions, and then they would develop infections. That does not happen with the anti-PD-1 agents. But okay. it has to be very expensive, uh, this kind of procedure, yeah. right? Yeah. It's much more expensive than the chemo, I'm assuming. 100%, so any new drug, because it takes the companies, the companies spend a lot of money through clinical trials to get any drug approved here in the mm -hmm. United States. So those, ones are, those drugs are very expensive drugs. But what usually happens for people here living in the United States is that once a drug is approved and once a drug has shown activity in treating cancer, one, that drug becomes covered by Medicare. That's one. Yeah, but would regular insurance pay for it? Regular insurance would, would also pay for it. Would also pay for it. Yes. So That's the patients in spaces where anti-PD-1 drugs have been approved, private insurance would also pay for it. But remember, for private insurance, most of those patients who develop cancer are above the six, uh, age of 65. Mm. So most of the financial cost of treatment is going to be taken or going to be covered by Medicare because so Medicare it's, covers it's patients. it's better then. Yes. Yeah. Great, good, really good information uh, good. to date. So uh, anything else would you would like to add uh, about this? I would like to talk to you next time about different kind, uh, different types of, of cancer, uh, hopefully soon. That would be good. Yes. Be good. The only thing, other thing that I'd like to add is this message to the patient that when you see blood in the urine, don't just wait until you start developing bladder pain or bone pain or you start having cough or you're coughing or headache. When you see blood in the urine, please go and see your primary care provider. It's a sign. That's it's it. a sign. You have to go because if you wait and if this disease basically spreads to the yes. left nodes or spreads mm -hmm, somewhere mm -hmm. else inside the body, we don't, have, we don't have good treatment for it. The earlier you come in in bladder cancer, the better is the outcome of treatment and le less invasive is the treatment. Yeah, so patients should uh, have an active role in you know, caring for 100%. their cancer and uh, probably educate themselves more and probably ask many questions. Uh, yes, 100%. Okay, excellent. Uh, thank you so much thank for you your so much time, for Dr. Al-Ani. Thank you. And we'll see you soon. We'll see you there. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.